This podcast is a part of the Podmania Podcasting Network. Check out podmania.co.uk to check out more of our great podcasts, features, reviews, match ratings and previews spanning the crazy and diverse world of professional wrestling. What's up everybody and this is an episode of Wrestling with Jonners. Uh, we're live on the scene here from Blackpool, England and I'm here with uh, Matt Bayliss, a uh, friend, former colleague of mine, Wrestling with Jonners buddy. How you doing Matt? Good evening. Yeah, good. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for bringing me along with you today as well. No, that's fine. And uh, this is episode 94 of the Wrestling with Jonners podcast and uh, we're on the scene in, in Blackpool. We've just seen NXT UK take over Blackpool 2 from the Empress Ballroom, the Winter Gardens. Uh, it's fair old to get here but definitely definitely worth it and uh, lots to kind of go through we're, we're going to be recapping the main card that happened at the Empress Ballroom and of course it's the third NXT UK takeover um, the first of which was 12 months ago pretty much a year to the day when they did the first NXT UK takeover Blackpool 1 and that was the uh, momentous occasion where that was an epic main event between Pete Dunne and Joe Coffey and Joe Coffey features in the main event to this one as well but uh, um, kind of we, we travelled down here today Matt and um, obviously the expectation are quite high, some really good matches to look forward to. We were discussing in the car on the way down that the card was pretty stacked. Five really top matches to look forward to, but kind of coming down here, what was you looking forward to most? Uh, just the atmosphere, I think, was the main thing. So, I've seen uh, like the previous takeovers, uh, not been to one previously, uh, so I was quite excited to, to come along and, and sort of like be a part of it. Uh, in terms of the matches, I think probably Devlin against Tyler Bate was probably the one I was looking forward to the most. Um, but overall, the card was really, really strong. Yeah, got to agree. And uh, I think I have to agree with Matt there. The match I was most looking forward to is uh, Tyler Bate and Jordan Devlin. I think it's been a, a, a bit of a dream match we've been waiting for for a long time. A lot of us probably wanted it as far back as last summer when they were building towards uh, TakeOver Cardiff. We didn't get that. What we did get was an excellent main event between Tyler Bate and Walter, of course. But uh, uh, Jordan Devlin's been one of them characters that's kind of been bubbling under the surface for quite a while now on NXT UK. We know that he's very capable. Uh, we'd love him to see him challenge for, you know, some of the championships, the UK championship in particular, somewhere down the line. But today's match against uh, Tyler Bate didn't disappoint, and I can't wait to talk about that one very soon. But uh, definitely a match that we've been looking forward to for a while, and they, they, we knew that they were going to deliver, and they definitely, definitely delivered. But uh, um, like I say, let's talk about the, the atmosphere inside the Empress Ballroom. Um, like I say, it's a very special kind of venue, and this is the third time they've been there. Obviously, uh, they had the very first United Kingdom Championship tournament two years ago to the day, pretty much, or three years ago, sorry, I think. I think it was January 2017. And that was a really good two-night show uh, with Tyler Bate winning the tournament, beating Pete Dunne in the final, becoming the first ever UK champion. And then, of course, uh, we... We, we come back to the Empress Ballroom last year for uh, TakeOver Blackpool 1, which was an epic show, and back here again uh, 12 months later. So this seems to be a bit of a, a spiritual home for NXT UK, really, doesn't it, Matt? Yeah, it seems to be like it's going to be their, like, kind of like their home their home ground, so I expect them to come back again next year. Um, but then hopefully they'll, uh, they'll look to kind of move the other UK TakeOvers around a little bit. Uh, we were talking earlier about whether they're going to just stick with doing two a year or if maybe they can stretch to putting at least one more on as well or maybe even venturing out into Europe as well yeah that would be really cool to see what they do in the future and I think they've definitely got the fan base now that they've, they've built the fan base to possibly look into doing slightly bigger arenas than say the Motor Point or the Empress Ballroom I think they should come back here um, once a year or maybe once every couple of years because it is kind of quite a, a spiritual home for the brand um, and uh, but but yeah, you know we discussed possibly using Wembley Arena, which I think can hold easily four or five thousand. Um, or you've got to, you know some some uh, good venues that, uh, without going too silly, can hold a good you know four five six thousand quite comfortably. Um, but uh, yeah, like I say, I know that uh, a lot of the. UK brand has European talent on there, like Walter, of course, uh, the, the champion going into tonight, um, is from Austria, and you know, obviously, 
Walter's massive in Germany, and uh, I know that WWE have ties with WXW over in Germany. So it'd be you know be good to kind of experiment with maybe going a bit further afield and uh, maybe doing a, a takeover in Germany or across Europe. I think the UK brand kind of covers all of Europe, if we're honest, and it'd be good. And I know this has been discussed in many circles for them to add maybe a secondary title, which could maybe encompass more of a European feel, like the old WWF European title, maybe. Yeah, I think that especially with the talent they've got, you got people like uh, Desmond Wolfe and um, uh, Ilya as well, who who'd be ideal going for that as well. And also, then you can always bring uh, people like Devlin into it as well, um, and maybe having that mid card title might be something that that he could take and run with as well. Yeah, definitely. Well, I know that we we had a, a couple of um, pre-show matches uh, that I presumed were going to be recorded for this coming Thursday's NXT UK on the network. And the first match was A Kid uh, versus Joseph Connors, yeah. uh, and that was a good little match, really fun little match. First time uh, I've seen Joseph Connors in the flesh. I've seen A Kid, and in fact, we both seen A Kid at a Progress show um, about a year ago. That was a really fun match. I think Joseph Connors picked up the win there. Then we had a second uh, kind of pre-show match, which was Cassius Ono versus Dave Mastiff, and that was another really fun match. And um, uh, Unfortunately, Cassius Ono on the losing end, but putting over a, a very popular British talent, Dave Mastiff went over in that match. But uh, a couple of couple of good opening matches to kind of kickstart things, get get the fans warmed up before the main card started. But uh, what were your impressions of those two uh, dark matches, pre-show matches, Matt? Yeah, they were really really good. Um, you know, like using some talent that people are already aware of, and obviously getting Cassius Ono on there as well is, is a pretty big name for a pre-show. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it, as warm up matches go, they, they were quite good. They got people involved, um, and you know, there's clear kind of like heels and faces in the matches. Uh, got the got the the, uh, the the you know the the crowd involved in it as well. Got some good reactions to to some of what was going on. You know, both both the two pretty tidy matches. Yeah, no, definitely. But um, everybody was looking forward to that the main show, uh, the main card, and the first uh, match to kick it off um, was was two really popular wrestlers and uh, um, Trent Seven versus Eddie Dennis. Uh, Eddie Dennis, as a matter of fact, is the current uh, Progress World or Unified Champion in Progress, um, but he's just returned from kind of quite a serious. Uh, tricep injury or shoulder injury I know he's had a, 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 mo- a number of injuries over the last couple of years but uh, he was really good in this match um, you're, you're not a, a, the biggest fan of Trent Seven though are you? No it's um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that I'm in a massive minority um, by, by not being a big fan but but no to be fair I was I was, I was impressed with him I really enjoyed this match um, conversely I'm a massive Eddie Dennis fan yeah. Um, You've been watching him for quite so, a few years. Yeah, you? I've been watching him, harassing him, <laughs> following him around with inflatable sheep and all sorts. So, um, but yeah, but I, I really enjoyed it. It was like two, you know, both pretty big, powerful guys, um, both definitely over with the crowd in their own way. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, re- really strong match with uh, some really good spots in it as well, in- including almost seeing the, the demise of uh, Trent Seven at one point. Man, that was crazy. I mean, the, the first thing that struck me was. Um, I think that the crowd were really, really enthusiastic for Trent Seven's entrance, and I think he got a massive pop, and he really kind of got them all into a frenzy, doing his roll into the ring, and then the tail spot where he throws it over the ropes. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, that was an excellent entrance. Really loved his entrance there. Um, but yeah, it was a bit of a, a battle between the two of them. The spot that Matt was just referring to when, because uh, Eddie Dennis usually does like the razor's edge or crucifix bomb. I think he calls it the, um, the, the Seven Bridge or something like that. I'm not. Yeah, something like that. But he, he did it to Trent Seven. But instead of doing it inside the ring, he, th- he he performed the movie through Trent Seven out of the ring, over the top rope, onto some lackey on the outside. It looked devastating, didn't it? Um, but uh, I mean, the, the poor guy that got landed on. Uh, well, I, I, <laughs> I hope he got paid well for doing that. Uh, but uh, Trent Seven did get back into the ring. But that spot was a bit of a holy shit moment, wasn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Especially in the <clears throat> in the first match of the show as as, uh, uh, as well. It was um, you know, it's a really good way to get going and really got the crowd off their feet because it came about because uh, Eddie had taken the turnbuckle off in the corner and uh, Trent Seven accidentally. Got sort of like knocked into it, and then the uh, he was about to do the seven, the seven bridge bomb into the, the, the exposed turnbuck, and the ref was uh, was blocking him from doing it. So he kind of just sidestepped and dumped him over the top rope. It was, you know, the angle we were at. Sort of like you didn't really realise until he did it what he was doing. Uh, you just thought he was just going to dump him down somewhere else, but then 
to go like launch him over the top rope into <laughs> you know the the lackey that was there you know to try and break the fall um you know and yeah it was it was brutal and it was sort of like definitely like a, a, a holy shit oh my god sort of moment and i but yeah it was like in terms of starting off the night right it was a it was a really good good way of kind of setting the tone for what was to come yeah and just going back to that move it's the sort of thing that you do on like a a, a, a wwe computer game isn't it where you oh, kind yeah, of you, you throw you you throw your opponent off the top of the hell in a hell in a cell cage or over the top rope with a power bomb or something like that. it was something that you wouldn't normally see but that was that was devastating it's probably something they practiced on crash mats but uh, to do it and to see it in, in real life in person was was pretty special uh, but like i say trent seven did recover got back into the match i don't think the match went too much longer after that and uh, eddie dennis uh, won the match with his next stop driver um so that that was a good win for eddie dennis i suppose and to be honest with you i don't think it hurts trent seven to kind of suffer a loss there um but um yeah two good wrestlers good way to kick off uh, nxt takeover um, can't wait to see that match back on the network but uh, yeah really good match and then that led us nicely into the match uh it was a three-way uh triple threat match for the women's title uh kaylee ray the defending nxt uk women's champion going up against former champion tony storm and piper niven now we were discussing kind of on the journey up here whether piper niven would be part of the match um you know she's had a uh, health issues recently we don't really want to kind of go too much into that but but we're wondering whether they were going to do some sort of backstage angle to maybe get somebody else involved or to turn it into a two-way. It wasn't clear whether she was going to be fit or well enough to wrestle in the match, but really happy to see that not only was she in the match, but she was fucking awesome in the match as well. Yeah, I mean, we so when when she came out, it's sort of like it was a relief that she was there, and then in sort of like the opening the opening moments of the match, she did. Uh, a dive through between the ropes onto the outside onto Kaylee Ray, and I thought I think I nudged you at the time and said uh, definitely fit help again. <laughs> so uh, so it was it was good. So obviously the match didn't lose anything from the build or, or get changed at the last minute or anything. So uh, but yeah, it was a you know, re- a really good performance by by all three of the women involved. Yeah, I mean Piper Niven was not only doing dives, she was hitting sentons outside the ring. Uh, we saw a massive senton off the top turnbuckle to the outside from Kaylee Ray as well. Uh, the crowd are really behind Piper Niven, I think, because they've seen quite a lot of Tony Storm and they've seen quite a lot of Kaylee Ray. They haven't seen an awful lot of Piper Niven. Obviously, very supportive. A lot of them knowing that the story that's going on in real life for for Piper. And there was a, a huge amount of support for Piper Niven. A lot of people actually believed that she was actually going to do it. Um, I was hoping and believing for a split second that she might do it. Uh, I would have loved it if, if she had. Um, but, uh, I mean, in, in the end, uh, the, the, I think Piper Niven nearly had the match one. I think she... Did she hit a Canadian destroyer on Kaylee Ray? Yeah, um, she, uh, she hit a Canadian destroyer, which um, which Tony Storm managed to break up at the yeah. last minute. There's there quite a few, like, really close near falls towards the end, including one where... Um, I think Tony Storm was on the outside and uh, the ref was about to count three on a pin and Tony kind of dived into the ring and grabbed the referee's arm rather than breaking up the pin itself she actually grabbed the referee's arm which was you know like probably not unique it probably has happened elsewhere but you know it was a really good spot yeah and a sort of a desperation move to uh, to keep the match alive. Yeah, definitely. But uh, it was a really hot match, and to be honest with you, it needed to be because coming out of the previous UK takeover in Cardiff, uh, Tony Storm's match with Kaylee Ray was easily the worst match of the night. Unfortunately, it really stood out like a sore thumb compared to the other five matches uh, on that card in Cardiff. Um, and they really redeemed themselves tonight. I felt that Tony Storm had one of her better matches I've seen live in person. Probably one of her better matches on the NXT UK brand. Uh, Kaylee Ray just smashes it every single time anyway. You add Piper Niven in there, you know, back to full health, full fitness. She looked great. Um, and not only did the three wrestlers um, absolutely deliver, but the fans ate up just about everything they did in the ring as well. Uh, but so uh, the end of the match came uh, when, uh, let's see, I, th- I think Storm came off the top rope um, and uh, on onto Piper, but Kaylee Ray kicked Tony Storm with like a, 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 a savant kick or a super kick to the side of the head uh, for the pins. So uh, Kaylee Ray kind of stole the win there at the end, really, uh, with a bit of a sneaky finish. But uh, it kind of fitted with the story that was being told in the match. It's a really good three way. I think all three women kind of knocked it out of the park. And uh, although Kaylee Ray retained i don't think anybody's massively disappointed in that because she's a really good champion and she's actually uh, you know not only uh, 
delivering on the NXT UK brand, but she's delivering on the, the black and gold brand over in the States as well, uh, making a bit of a name for herself. So yeah, um, I think that, you know, the, the opening match, Eddie Dennis, Trent Seven definitely delivered. I think this took it up a notch, Matt. What about yourself? Yeah, definitely. It was good. Um, we, we spoke afterwards about the um, like the position in the matches and, and how the, the the show flowed. And, and I think, to be honest, they got it. They got it spot on, really, with sort of like the the order of the matches and the way that it built towards um, towards the end of the show, yeah. to, you know, to the last match and to after the last match, which obviously we will. Uh, if you're not already aware, then obviously you're living under a rock. But um, <laughs> yeah. um, obviously we'll we'll get to that in a little bit. But. <laughs> yeah, but uh, an excellent three-way match. Really can't wait to see that one back as well. Uh, the next match, as we alluded to at the very top of the podcast, was the match we were both looking forward to the most going into it. Uh, Tyler Bate, former NXT UK, uh, WWE UK champion, of course, um, against uh, Jordan Devlin. Now, this match, I think like all good wrestling matches told a story but it, it kind of started off slow and it built and it built and it built and it built to the point where the fans were uh, kind of uh, at a frenzy a fever pitch at the very end and it was the perfect wrestling match i'm not saying it was saying it was a five-star classic but between these two you know we knew that they were going to deliver a good match and they did and i don't think we were in any doubt that they uh, that they wouldn't, to be honest with you. I mean, there was one spot, and I think where it really started to pick up for me was when Tyler Bate did his aeroplane spin um, spot, which he tends to do against all opponents, regardless of their size. He's done it to Walter before. He's done it to many others, but he did it to uh, uh, to uh, Jordan Devlin here. Now, I think it was quite interesting how he actually started the move because I think Jordan Devlin um, attempted a move. Tyler Bate caught him on his shoulders, but he was the wrong way round. So I think he was kind of um, either on his back or his front, but he kind of flipped him over in order to get him into the perfect position for the aeroplane spin. And then did about 30 rotations where he just got faster and faster and faster. And just when you, if that was any normal person, you'd, you'd slow down, but not Tyler Bate. He sped up. He did about 30 revolutions with uh, Jordan Devlin on his back. And the fans were just... A hook, line, and sinker. That was it. You know, um, they were on their feet cheering. The place uh, nearly blew up. To be honest with you, with the with the crowd noise. But um, yeah, I mean, it, you know, they, they they gave us everything and more. But uh, what were your impressions of this match? It was a fantastic one. Yeah, I think I agree with you. I think the the way it was it was put together, the way it told a story, was really good. And I think following on from like the airplane spin spot was when they uh, it became like a bit of a, a bit of a slugfest. And yeah, it was sort of like taking it in turns, like punching each other in the jaw and headbutts and it just went on and on and every time you thought someone was getting the upper hand the other one would come back and it was brutal and even from where we were you could hear the shots <laughs> and um, you know it was really good and, and I think there, there was twice in the match where Tyler tried to do his move where he puts his uh, his one hand up in the air and and, and when the when his opponent looks up he clocks him with a right and uh, I think the first time he tried it Devlin blocked it and the second time we tried it towards the end of the match, um, Devlin didn't even look up but clocked Tyler um, straight away across the across the jaw, probably about the twentieth or thirtieth time in the exchange. And you know, it just it just built and built and built. And there was a spot near the end where they were both on the top rope, and they could like they kind of switch positions while both balanced on the top rope. And it's like, you know, we f you fully expected them to to fall one way or another. And and uh, and in the end, they they, they flipped it around into a, a massive um, Spanish fly move from Devlin. Yeah. Um, you know, which you know, was how just they managed to kind of switch positions while they were stood on the top turnbuckle because originally it would have been a perfect position for uh, Tyler Bate to have hit the Spanish fly. Not that that's typically in his move set, but then somehow they managed to switch switch positions. Um, obviously in Jordan Devlin's favour so that he could hit his uh, patented Spanish fly off the top turnbuckle but yeah that was just phenomenal and uh, I've not seen that kind of um, uh, that kind of transition or to that set up for that type of move before but that was really cool um, but uh, yeah like I say it's one of the matches where you're going to get lots of false finishes lots of close near falls lots of kick outs um, but in the end uh, Tyler Bate won the match with his Tyler Driver 97 and then he, he didn't win the match with a Tyler Driver 97 that was his setup for like a corkscrew plancher um, and then got the win it was a really hard fought win um, and well, I mean, it was my match of the night, to be honest with you. I think it kind of built and built, and it gave you the perfect wrestling match. And after the match, um, you even had from a balcony just opposite the ring, you had Triple H, you had uh, William Regal, Johnny Saint, 
three kind of you know figureheads really of the NXT and NXT UK brand and the British scene and you know what they're trying to achieve with the UK brand um, essentially giving the two fighters the two wrestlers a round of applause but in particular uh, Tyler Bate there that was kind of soaking up all the applause and soaking up all the adulations from uh, Triple H and co um, possibly pointing towards maybe more of a, a full-time career over in the States I don't know but it certainly looked it was that sort of you know, farewell sort of round of applause, wasn't it? To be honest with you, did you did that kind of strike you as well, Matt? Yeah, definitely. It was like you know, it was, it was like a full on standing ovation from everyone, and it went on for a long time. Um, you know, not in a negative way whatsoever. Um, you know, it was it was really positive, and I think you know, like with the history at the, that arena as well. I think the fact that Tyler became the first champion yeah. there. I think there's there's a lot of love there. Um, Triple H even tweeted about the match as well um, with some pictures saying it's the. I think he described it as the the sort of match they need to watch from the crowd um, rather than watching it from the back on a monitor and uh, you know and, and I think that that says a lot that it was something that, that he he was excited to see as well yeah. um, as much as you know the, as, as us punters were as well so yeah it's one of the matches you know that you can probably. Uh, relate to you know some classic WrestleMania matches of the past, you know Chris Jericho versus Shawn Michaels for example, or Kurt Angle. Some of his great matches. I know he's had a you know, Kurt Angle. You pick any WrestleMania match of his, but then two technical you know all-round wrestlers um, that you know can deliver, and that's certainly what we had in these two, Tyler Bate and uh, and Jordan Devlin. And uh, wow, well, yeah. I mean, that's probably up there and probably on a par with uh, Tyler Bates' match with Walter and possibly on a par with his match with Pete Dunne. And, you know, this guy can deliver four or five-star matches at the drop of a hat. And if he does go over to the black and gold brand over in the States, then fantastic, good opportunity for him. Um, But, uh, yeah, uh, really, really good match. But um, any final thoughts on that one, Matt? Uh, Just that it was phenomenal. And and, and I, I always feel the need to just remind people constantly that Tyler Bates still... A baby, basically. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It's, um, so imagine, you know, if he's this good now, imagine, imagine what he's going to, you know, if he stays free of any like major, like too serious injuries and stuff like that, you know, the, the he's de- he, the people like him are definitely the future of the business. Yeah, exactly. I mean, was he 23? Yeah, it's, it's incredible kind of what he's been able to achieve so far. And uh, if he stays fit and healthy, you know, and, and he is kind of, he, he does look after himself. I know that he's, he's a vegan, so he looks after his diet. He looks like a million dollars. Um, so hopefully uh, he gets treated the right way wherever he goes, whether it's stateside or whether he stays in the UK. But I was saying to uh, Matt and a, a few others earlier that I think he's achieved um, all he can possibly achieve or hope to achieve on the UK brand. So maybe, you know, going stateside and doing a bit more work there might make sense for him, to be honest with you. But um, then we had our kind of second to last match and it was the fatal four-way ladder match for the NXT UK uh, tag team champions, defending champions Gallus going in, defended against former champions, uh, the Grizzled Young Veterans and the South Wales subculture, Mark Andrews and Flash Morgan Webster. And uh, a match that's not featured in a, a takeover before, at least I don't think they have um, Imperium, Fabian Eichner and Marcel Bartel. And it's my first time that I've seen Marcel, uh, Fabian Eichner in the flesh. I've seen Marcel Bartel uh, wrestle before, but not Fabian Eichner. No, but uh, adding the, the the gimmick of the ladders into it, you know, is always um, a recipe for a dramatic match, and always a recipe for kind of a bit of a nail biter and some really big spots. Um, and we got that here. Um, but there was definitely lots of ladders involved. I think at one point there was five or six ladders inside the ring, and you had all eight wrestlers climbing up, uh, you know, the ladders to, uh, to to retrieve the belts. But um, any any spots in particular that stood out to you in the Fatal Four Way? Uh, there's a there's a quite a bit of innovation to begin with as well. Um, I think there was a point where I think both of the um, the South Wales subculture guys got stuck in the corner behind ladders, uh, getting squashed into the corner. And there's, you know there's quite a lot of a lot of use of the ladders as weapons early on, um, and then it kind of just escalated from there. Really, I think that obviously the spot where everyone was a sort of varying ladders. I think I think um, Flash Morgan rested a ladder on top of someone to climb up at one point um in in that spot and then obviously there was um they got the big ladder which i don't know why they never used the big ladder to get the titles because it'd be a lot easier but the big ladder always seems to be the spot ladder so um and it was set up on the outside wasn't it and they tried to uh, set up a couple of tables either side of the ladder rested against the ring apron and the guardrail 
Um, and I think that the plan was to was it to put each member of Imperium or Gallus? Gallus yeah, it was the two Gallus guys. Two so, Gallus guys uh, on the table. Each table, and then uh, Flash and, and Mark Andrews were going to go up, go up the big ladder and go off either side. But unfortunately, um, uh, Mark Coffey's table broke or tipped or something as they were getting onto yeah. it. So, um, so a bit of quick thinking or you know stupidity or whatever depending on which way you look at it um so flash and uh and mark andrews both went up the one side of the ladder and did sort of like a, a piggyback sent on from the top of this 20 foot ladder <laughs> once again you you know innovation being good thinking on your feet because i don't think it was a planned spot i don't think they planned for the other table to break and so i'm sure that they were planning to do you know uh, a double sent on uh through each table onto their respective opponents but uh yeah to kind of use their um use their quick thinking ability to but but yeah i mean it, it kind of it was a bit of a dangerous spot to be honest with you, but they must have been a good for ten or fifteen feet up, um, yeah, comfortably. Yeah, so that so. that ladder was huge, but so that was a pretty uh, impressive spot. Um, another spot that I remember James Drake inside the ring. He did a four fifty um, off of one of the ladders onto one of the opponents inside the ring. That was pretty cool. Um, but uh, Eichner uh, towards the end of the match, he got smashed through one of the ladders that was propped up in the corner, and, and the ladder. I, I'm not sure if it was gimmicked or not. Possibly so. Um, but he went straight through the ladder, and the ladder kind of broke in half. So that was uh, quite an impressive uh, spot there. Um, and then Bartel, Marcel Bartel, he got tipped off of the ladder. Um, out onto the rest of the opponents on the outside of the ring. Um, and then that allowed Gallus to come back into the ring and uh, they pulled the belts down and retained the championships. And uh, it, it was a good match. Like I say, uh, to be nitpicky, this was probably the only match where it did have uh, maybe some quieter moments where there wasn't any action going on. Um, but that's fine. You know, all eight guys told a really good story. And it did flow quite well, to be honest with you. There were a lot of good high spots that got people out of their chairs. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of pleased that Gallus retained. I would have liked to have seen Imperium pick up the championships, only because they were the only uh, team out of the four that hadn't won the title so far. Uh, but I'm sure their time will come. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it was an opportunity to allow Gallus to shine. And uh, I was quite pleased for Mark Coffey and uh, Wolfgang. And, uh, yeah, overall, it was a really good match. Um, what, what do you think? Yeah, I think I, I agree with that. There's, there's a couple of points where I think, you know, obviously everyone's taken a, taken a bit of a pasting on it and, and they're going to need the, the time to rest and recuperate. But um, I think potentially it could have, you know, they could have, like, made it flow a little bit better and filled the gaps with other people coming in. But, but I suppose, likewise, the crowd needs a breather as well. So if... Uh, you know, if you're up and down, sort of like popping for everything, then the the kind of like the rest spot kind of like resets it a little bit, and then they can build up again to the, to the next spot. But but yeah, but I, overall, I, I wasn't disappointed with the result. It's one it's one of those matches that I didn't really mind who won. Yeah, um, I wasn't. Because you've got like, four excellent teams there, haven't you? Yeah, really? exactly. Yeah, and, and you could see potentially like with with any of the teams, you know, like going forward with titles, they you know they could go on and do some good things, and and storyline wise, they could do some interesting things with them as well. So yeah. Yeah, really good match. And uh, that led us nicely to the main event. Now, I've been uh, open on the podcast you know, about not being the biggest uh, fan of, of Joe Coffey. I thought he was excellent in the main event against Pete Dunne 12 months ago. But um, Gallus have almost gone through this transition over the last few months where they've been promoted more as, as tweeners slash babyface going after Imperium on weekly kind of NXT UK TV um, and uh, kind of leading up to I know that they, they got a, a feature on the WWE Network kind of getting us all hyped for uh, TakeOver Blackpool 2 and after watching that I was I was sold to be honest with you and I was actually kind of really rooting for uh, Joe Coffey in this match I'm also a big fan of, of Walter I know it was your first um, viewing in the flesh of Walter um, this match it was it was brutal in a good way. It was really hard hitting. They knocked seven bales of crap out of one another. There were so many big moves. I mean, within the first few minutes, they kind of went out of the ring into the crowd. Joe Coffey kind of dived over the the guard railing into Walter with some sort of spear or headbutt. Um, but uh, I think what a lot of people will remember from this match are the chops, um, Walter's chops in particular, and he must have laid good eight to ten chops to Joe Coffey and 
every single one of them cracked and reverberated around the Empress Ballroom. And like you say, some of them were like a gun going off. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the chops and the hard hitting, you, you, you're going to get it from these two, um, you know, these two beasts, to be honest with you. Because let's be honest, Joe Coffey can handle himself as, as much as anybody. Um, but uh, yeah, this was a, a really, really um, hard hitting match. Um, but uh, any, anything in particular that you remember fondly from this match, Matt? Yeah, it's good. I think again they paced it really well. Um, I think it, like there was like the kind of the initial barrage where uh, Joe Coffey took charge, um, and then it kind of slowed down, and it was you know it was two big guys fighting, and and um, it was quite slow paced to begin with, and and it was a, it, and Walter was taking a lot of the punishment as well, which was a bit of a surprise um, up until the point where Joe Coffey decided to try and chop him, and like you could actually see Walter's um, you know facial expression change and. He got this sort of like the kind of the, the evil twisted grin and was, you know, was begging him to do it again, do it again. And, and then it just became like a bit of a, uh, a chop fest and, <laughs> and it was it was brutal. You know, eye water, some of them were eye watering. It yeah. was, uh, Unfortunately, Joe Coffey came out on the losing end on a lot of them chops, yeah, didn't he? Definitely, yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I think there's I think the first or second that Walter hit him with, like, I think Walter hurt his hand to hit him that hard. Yeah. So. Uh, but yeah, you know, but that that was really good because then that kind of like took the match onto the next level and, and really kind of like got the pace up a little bit. Yeah. There was uh, there was one spot again where they were precariously on the on the top turnbuckle, and obviously after after last year's takeover in Blackpool where yeah. where Joe Coffey fell off the top or um, you know was pushed off the top twice in the match with Pete Dunne. Yeah. Um, but they just about managed to hold it together and, and, and sort of like perform the move off the top. But uh, I still think they went a bit sideways rather than towards the middle of the ring. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, it was... It was one of them kind of, of w- wincing moments where you yeah. thought one of them was going to land on the head. And I think Walter very nearly did land on his head. But, uh, yeah. yeah. And, and, you know, I was also impressed Walter did um, switch it up a little bit. He, he kind of did show uh, some submission skills. He did put some uh, submission holds on, which he's quite uh, adapt in doing. Um, one thing that really impressed me was Joe Coffey he did a, a deadlift German suplex on, on Walter and Walter it was he 6 foot 4 320 pounds um, we know Joe Coffey's a, a beast and he looked really impressive kind of like uh, he just looked ready for this match. He looked, he looked, uh, you know, in really good shape. But he, you know, he deadlifted this big guy um, off the mat, up into the air, German suplex. That was really, really impressive. Um, but uh, and, and then there was the moment where Walter uh, killed the referee. Um, it was like, oh my god, you know, you've killed Kenny, sort of thing. But oh my god, Walter, you killed the referee. And um, I think he was meant to have drop kicked. Joe Coffey but instead uh, he, he drop kicked the referee clean out of the ring um, and uh, probably into the 10th row as well yeah I think so I mean obviously we, we started the night with uh, you know the potential demise of uh, of Trent Seven and, and yeah I'm, I'm pretty sure we're probably still working <laughs> on this ref now to try and uh, revive him for uh, for the next lot of shows um, but yeah it was it was sort of like a shotgun drop kick which, which uh, Coffey got out of the way of the ref took it sort of like full in the middle of the chest, bounced out of the ring, through the ropes, and uh, yeah, it's probably probably the best bef- uh, the best uh, ref bump I've <laughs> ever seen. Best ref bump I've, I've and, ever uh, seen. Yeah, and it was you know it was brutal. It was like I mean that got a you know massive intake of breath from everyone, as much as you know anything else in the night, and uh, um, yeah, and it's just sort of like it led to. Uh, to a bit of interference then afterwards because uh, Joe Coffey pinned Walter. Obviously, there's no he got no a visual ref. pinfall, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. And there's no ref, so the crowd were chanting for VAR, um, which was a bit of a recurring theme throughout the evening. Um, and uh, but obviously, there's no, no one there to make the count. So, uh, so then uh, Desmond Wolf comes down, sort of like to help out his uh, his his leader and in, in Walter, and um, it kind of just like kind of broke down really from from that point onwards so yeah and it looks like uh, wolf came down and then Ilya dragonov came down to kind of counter um alexander wolf of course um and, and walter kind of destroyed Ilya dragonov so it looks like that could potentially be an opponent for walter somewhere down the line um and then we had some you know lots of uh, shenanigans around the ring there was lots of uh uh, I think Walter was was kind of beating down Joe Coffey to be honest with you and then the end of the match came when 
Walter, first of all, power bombed Joe Coffey and then got him to submit in, in some sort of like step over cross face, really. It was it was a bit of a cross face move, wasn't it? Where he was yeah, wrenching we, back. we were at a bad, a bad vantage point yeah, for it. We, we couldn't, couldn't really see, see it front the move. face on. So it's it's amazing when you watch wrestling live in, in like a bigger arena like that that the submissions are far less impressive than when they're on TV. Because obviously, yeah. on the TV, when, when you see it on TV and you've got the camera in their face, you can. You can sort of like hear the ref asking them and everything. It's a lot clearer what's going on. But then, when you're in in a, in a big arena like that, if you if you're not at the vantage point where you can see what's happening, it it does make it a little bit, um, a little bit more a little bit more difficult to see. So. Yeah, yeah. But um, it was uh, a unique way to end a main event match. To be honest with you. Um, Obviously, you know, there's various ways you can win a match, but you don't often see big, important matches like that end via submission. Um, so it's, you know, obviously thought through from the beginning how we're going to kind of close this match down, how we're going to come to a conclusion. And uh, having Joe Coffey kind of tap out at the end was, was a, uh, a different way to what we usually see in a WWE ring. Um, but um, one of their matches that kind of had a really, really good, powerful story going through it. Uh, Joe Coffey did give as, as good as he, he got. He couldn't kind of really have an answer to Walter's chops, unfortunately. Um, but, you know, Joe Coffey did have some, some time to shine in the ring there. Um, and, uh, yeah, it was a really good main event match. Um, I don't think it was as good as uh, Joe Coffey's match with Pete Dunne last year or Tyler Bates' match with Walter in August, but uh, a really, really good way to close out the show. Or at least we thought that was how it was going to close out the show. You, you, the rest of Imperium came down. You had Walter, uh, Fabian Eichner, Marcel Bartel, Alexander Wolf there. They're all kind of celebrating Walter's win. I should imagine if you were watching this on the network, the copyright logo probably came up on the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. Uh, and then what did we get, Matt? Adam Cole, baby. Adam Cole, a disputed era, uh, snuck in from behind. Um, you kind of heard the, the, the roar of the crowd get louder from a small rumble to a loud rumble and then kind of the walls were shaken um, as uh, UE came in they uh, beat down Imperium um, and uh, yeah Roderick Strong was well into it he was throwing his, his shirt and his chain into, into the fans and um, I think in the end all four members of Undisputed Era had Walter um, to themselves in the ring and uh, whilst uh, holding Walter, I think they probably executed their high-low um, total elimination finisher. And uh, Adam Cole came in with a with a kind of a last was it a last shot? Is that yeah, it's got it running knee, yeah. shining wizard? Call it what you will from behind. Um, so all four members of Imperium were left laying, um, but to have undisputed era in the Empress Ballroom to attack Imperium, obviously further setting up their match that's going to be taking place in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, Worlds Collide, the, the the show that's taken over from TakeOver, um, the, the night before the Royal Rumble in a couple of weeks' time, NXT UK versus NXT, setting up that uh, kind of four-way main event perfectly between Imperium and Undisputed Era. Um, but uh, I don't think anybody in Blackpool were expecting it i think a lot of people were maybe hoping for it but we hadn't seen any spoilers we kind of you know they kept it under wraps really really nicely but uh it was a, a really kind of holy shit and a pleasant surprise to see adam cole and ue there um to attack imperium and walter to close out the show but um i know you were filming it i was marking out. i was marking out big time um and uh yeah it was a hell of a moment but what did you kind of uh, take away from that that moment well, I think we'd we'd spoke about it beforehand, and I think if it's probably fancy booking, really saying like, "Oh, it'd be great if at the end, if, if undisputed era turn up," but obviously there's no word of them being over or, or anything like that. So it was more it was more of a hopeful uh, get up. Wouldn't it be good if if uh, undisputed era rocked up at the end, and um, and then yeah, so you know the the match ended, and it was it was a good match. It was a good finish to the match, and and then um, and we were just really kind of waiting and and i was filming it thinking like well if something is going to happen it's going to happen now but you know there was no guarantee you know it could have been tyler coming out it could have been pete coming out they like to been... drag out these kind of dramatic endings yeah, don't they? <laughs> yeah and it's like we're there and then you could kind of see you could see someone sort of like gesticulating with with imperium in the ring and then you could see a production <laughs> assistant waving and then all of a sudden you just hear screams from uh, down in the crowd as as uh as ue just ran through and it was like 
and then like John nearly deafened me, uh, marking out down my <laughs> ear, and um, I was like, yeah, I'm filming. And so, um, <laughs> but yeah, but no, but it was, it was it was great, and you know, just you know, it, it was really well done. It's fitting, it's relevant because of obviously that we worlds collide coming up, and uh, you know, it's just really, and you know, to have those four coming into an NXT UK show. Um, and it's just, I think they're pretty much. I think they're the only four people that have appeared on every single brand um, in the last few months as well. Obviously, yeah. with the build up to Survivor Series, and you know, so they're getting absolutely everywhere. Um, and for, you know, for, for the place in the black and gold brand at the the top of the chain, really for for WWE. Um, I know officially they're not, but um, but you know, in the in the fans in the fans' eyes, I think they just epitomise everything that that is that is NXT. Yeah, definitely. But uh, uh, that was a, a really special moment, to be honest with you. I think everybody kind of uh, really appreciated UE being there, Adam Cole being there. You know, I don't know if it was on camera or off camera after they you know stopped uh, filming, but you know they they gave the fans what they wanted with the kind of Adam Cole Bebe chance and a boom a couple of times. So that was pretty good, and that's what you want to kind of see. Um, you know, when you've got undisputed here in the building. Um, but I think while the while the cameras were rolling with them kind of effectively standing over the body of Walter inside the ring, they're all very serious as if they mean business. And, uh, you know, there was no kind of chanting to the crowd then. But when they got back onto the stage on the rampway, that's when they were doing all the undisputed era, you know, gimmickry and uh, Adam Cole, baby. But um, it was good. Uh, I think, like I've said two or three times already, I can't wait to go back and watch that particular moment. I know you, you've probably already seen it back a couple of times on the network, on the uh, kind of walk back from the restaurant. Um, but uh, yeah, it was, it was a really, really special uh, show. Now, this is the second NXT UK takeover that I've been to. There's only been three, but I went to the one in Cardiff and that was great. And obviously you had a, a couple of uh, memorable moments there. Certainly Flash Morgan and Mark Andrews winning the tag titles was really memorable. And the main event, uh, Tyler Bate versus Walter. I think some of the, the main kind of takeaways from this show Blackpool 2, um, you know, definitely Tyler Bate versus Jordan Devlin. Love that. Uh, the, the crucifix bomb Eddie Dennis performed on uh, Trent Seven was a really holy shit moment. Um, I think Piper Niven and, and seeing her kind of fit and well and performing so well in the ring and really adding to that match, um, especially, you know, off the back of... The match that we saw in Cardiff um, in in August, which was you know a bit of a disappointment, and kind of Niven really added to the match and elevated the match, and you know I really wanted her to to win that one, but just seeing her kind of fit and well, and the fans really behind her, and then you know Walter's chops. To be honest with you, I think they're still reverberating around the Empress Ballroom as we speak, um, and I'm sure Mark Coffee's uh, Joe Coffee is going to be sore for a week. Um, he's going to be getting the the Vicks vapor rub on his on his chest. Um, and kind of soothing them, them hand prints or them paw prints, um, but and then of course seeing uh, undisputed era um, come out at the end. But um, I've, I've probably summed it up there, Matt. But what are your kind of highlights and takeaways from uh, Blackpool Two? Um, well, so my my first takeaway will be just me admitting I got something wrong. I got my wolf wrong. I think I mentioned Desmond Wolf. That's definitely not who uh, who came out and interfered. In now, the wasn't that is that Nigel McGuinness in, in T- yeah. uh, so, TNA? So technically he was there. I assume <laughs> on commentary, but he definitely didn't get involved. <laughs> in, uh, in the match, but um, I think for, yeah, I think highlights for me, other than spending a day with you, John, um, uh, and the food afterwards, which was fantastic. Yeah. Um, but I think from a wrestling perspective, um, yeah, I, I think yeah, any any time that I see uh, that I can see people like Eddie Dennis and Tyler Bate in an environment like this is like really big for me because they're they're some of the first people that I kind of got behind when I when I got into like Brit Rest. Um, but yeah, I think the the, the near death experiences for for um, in the in the opening match and and in in the final match as well for that poor referee for that, <laughs> for that poor referee and um, and for Trent Seven as well. You know, I think like they're like you know huge pop moments. Um, but yeah, but Ty, Tyler against Devlin was definitely match of the night for me. Um, but Walter and Joe Coffey didn't didn't disappoint, and I think you know in, in my mind they've both gone up in my estimations as well as. As wrestlers, as as main eventers, um, but yeah, but just seeing undisputed era at the end, you know, it's sort of like it's it's definitely one of those I was there sort of sort of moments, and it was a, it was it was a, a fantastic way to end a, a fantastic show overall. 
Yeah, it really was. And I think, um, you know, there were highlights in all five of the matches uh, that were part of the main card. And uh, yeah, like I've said a few times before, I can't wait to go back and watch it all again on the network when I get back home tomorrow. Um, but yeah, that's, that's pretty much um, our, our recap, our review of NXT UK TakeOver Blackpool 2. Um, so well, I just want to kind of thank you for helping us out with the podcast and thanks for being a great guest and a, a good friend. And it's been a, a pleasure spending the day with you in Blackpool. And uh, yeah, and uh, like I say, Drop in on the, the Wrestling with Jonas podcast. Of course, we, we drop every single Saturday with our weekly NXT and AEW recaps, uh, regular WWE and AEW pay per view reviews, um, exclusive interviews, and so much more. And just one plug that I'm going to throw out there just go and see our brand new uh, WrestlingWithJonas.com website. It is WrestlingWithJonas.com where you've got a full archive of podcasts, uh, vlogs, interviews, archive uh, of, of, of all of our articles from our team of writers, including uh, Mr. Matt Bayliss, who uh, is part of the team of writers that writes for the WrestlingWithJonas.com website. Daily news updates and uh, so much more. Um, so please go and check it out. Uh, all of our social media links are at the top of the page as well. Uh, so instead of me kind of spewing them out to you now, just go to the wrestlingwithjohners.com website. But uh, from me and from Mr. Matt Bayliss, and thanks again, Matt, for helping us out with this podcast, uh, we'll catch up with you all again very soon. Mm-hmm.